So, welcome to uh, this lecture on multi-phase flows. We uh, saw uh, some introductory concepts about uh, stability analysis uh, in the last class. Okay, Jason uh, spoke about uh, a two-dimensional system and he took an example and he just uh, worked out how you go about calculating the uh, stability of a system. Um, and especially if there is a parameter working, uh, you know, in the system, uh, then uh, that parameter could be something which you can control as an experimentalist. And what you want to do is, you want to find out how the stability of a system changes as you vary that parameter. So, that parameter could be flow rate, it could be temperature, it could be concentration, okay. So, um, like uh, was mentioned in the last class, what we really have to do as far as finding stability of a system, I mean is that it is decided by the response to perturbations, response to disturbances, right. This is defined on the basis of the response to disturbances. The idea is if you give a disturbance and if the system deviates from the steady state, you say it is unstable. If it comes back to the steady state, you say it is stable, okay. So, if the system comes back to the steady state, the state is stable, else it is unstable. So, I just wanted to emphasize again that when I am talking about stability, I am talking about stability of a state, okay. Now, this is what you understand in English and what we want to do is we want to develop a mathematical framework and what you got is some idea about this mathematical framework with the uh, in the context of a system of two variables which are dependent only on time but not on space. So, just to keep the mathematics simple. So, the example that was illustrated in the last class was that of two ordinary differential equations. So, what happens? You need the time dependency because see whenever you are talking about uh, stability, you are talking about response with respect to time. So, you always are talking about an unstable or an unsteady state system, okay. And therefore, you need the time dependency. To keep the math simple, we made it well stirred and then uh, you neglected the spatial variations. So, the basic idea so, whenever you want to find out the stability of a system, what are the steps you need? The steps to find stability is first write the governing equations. This could be equation of continuity, equation of momentum, conservation of mass, whatever it is, which are going to describe the system, okay. Then once you have the governing equations, what is the next thing you have to do? The next thing you have to do is find the steady state, okay. And this would be dependent upon the problem you are considering the first step. The second thing is find the steady state. Okay. Because it is the st stability of the steady state which you are interested in. So, you need to find the steady state whose stability you are talking about. 
And then, what do we do? We spoke about disturbances being given. So, what we want to do is, we want to give disturbances to the steady state, okay. And what we do is, we impose small, when I say small, I mean infinitesimal disturbances. And here is where the order of epsilon comes in. So, these are basically of order epsilon, very small disturbances. And that is the connection which I want to, you to make with the perturbation series thing that you have seen earlier. When you are trying to actually do things at, at order epsilon, you will be neglecting higher order terms, okay. So, what we want to do is we want to impose small disturbances. And what this basically allows me to do is, this order epsilon disturbance allows the linearization of the governing equations. So, the original equations will typically be nonlinear. okay. And uh, since you are talking only about small disturbances, what you will be doing is linearization. That is something which you also saw. You have a begin with a nonlinear system and you linearize it because you are getting only small disturbances. That is what you are doing, you do is you do a Taylor series expansion and you retain only the first order term. You do not go beyond the first order term. You do not take higher order terms because the higher order terms will be nonlinear. And then we look at the growth rate of the disturbances. Now, the growth rate, the disturbances, growth rate, growth or decay rate is given is exponential. In time, then it is of the form e power lambda t, and if lambda and since lambda will be some eigenvalue of some linear uh, operator, which we will see, lambda will turn out to be something like an eigenvalue. If the real part of lambda is negative, then it is going to decay and you have a stable system. If the real part of lambda is positive, it uh, is going to grow, okay. So, basically what this means is, the lambdas will be say the eigenvalues of a linear operator. If the real part of lambda is negative, the steady state is stable and if the real part of lambda is positive, it is unstable. There is just one subtle thing which I want to mention here that when you are doing this calculation, if it turns out that the real part of lambda is positive, that means even when you give a small disturbance, it is unstable. So, when you give any, any disturbance, a large disturbance, it will be unstable. So, if the real part of lambda is greater than 0, you can definitely conclude that the system is unstable, okay, for all disturbances. But if the real part of lambda is less than 0, you only know that you, it is stable for small disturbances. But suppose you give a big disturbance, it could be unstable, okay. So, that is the, uh, so you have to be kind of careful here. So, this is, whatever I am doing here is in the context of small disturbances. Okay. So, real part of lambda 
being greater than 0 is sufficient to guarantee the instability while real part of lambda is less than 0 is necessary to have stability. That is to say that you can have the condition can be a necessary condition or a sufficient condition for something to happen. So, I am just trying to tell you that real part of lambda is greater than 0 is sufficient. If it is satisfied, your guarantee is unstable. That is enough. You do not have to do anything else in life. If this is less than 0, you only know that the necessary condition has been satisfied. It is not assuring you that it is going to be unstable because of this thing of small disturbance and last, uh, you know. So, so, whatever stability we are going to be doing is actually going to be based on this linearized analysis. So, whatever we are going to be doing in this course is going to be based on this linearized analysis. What this means is these are what are called local stability conditions okay that is only restricted to small disturbances okay so the stability analysis analysis we will see in this class is based on linearization and hence are local in nature as opposed to or the other one global okay so whatever stability we are talking about is a local stability condition or a linearized stability condition okay so the analysis is called the linearized stability analysis so it turns out uh, these eigenvalues which are going to basically decide stability they are going to be dependent upon your operating conditions your flow rate or your temperature or your this thing uh, concentration and as you vary the parameter, these eigenvalues can actually change from having a negative real part to a positive real part. The growth rate, I want to use a more general term, the growth rate, which basically tells you how disturbances at a particular point change with time, okay. They can change from decay to growth. And uh, that is the thing that we are interested in. We are trying to find out this critical value when that is going to be a change in the behavior of the system okay so that's basically the, this is a mathematical framework so we spoke something in english now we are trying to put things in mathematical fr framework so that given any problem you can actually work and uh, proceed and address the question of finding the stability okay because that's the advantage of doing mathematics you can apply it to any system so it helps you generalize things okay so, what we will do today is work on a particular problem which is uh, basically going to take you to a partial differential equation, but it is not a flow problem okay and then we will do a flow problem later on because normally when you do a flow problem in a stability there is more than one equation. So, we are just going to uh, slowly add up the complexity. So, I am going to talk about stability in a reaction diffusion system okay so since I belong to the chemical engineering department, I need to have a chemical engineering example. And the, one of the reasons why I am choosing this example is because I only have to deal with one variable, either a concentration or temperature. So, in this case, it is a concentration. So, we can uh, see there are catalyst particles, particles 
with sustain. chemical reactions and most of you know uh, that catalysts exist because you have done this in our course in chemistry. What it does is uh, it basically provides an alternative path for the reaction to take place and makes the reaction go faster, okay. So, but the thing is the catalyst is usually deposited on a surface and it provides the site for the reaction to take place, okay. Now, in order for you to maximize the surface area available for the reaction to occur, what is normally done is that these catalysts are usually very porous, okay. So, basically what I am saying is the catalysts are porous in nature and this uh, is to maximize the surface area available for reaction, okay. So, we will keep life simple and uh, rather than talk about a spherical particle, we will just say that the particle is a rectangular slab, okay. So, imagine and just for the sake of working with Cartesian geometry, you can work with spherical coordinates. Uh, we um, assume uh, one dimensional problem because I just want to illustrate some ideas, dimensional problem, assume a one dimensional um, system which means take a rectangular slab of thickness L in the x direction and extending to infinity in the y and z directions, okay. So, I just extending to infinity in the other direction. So, what this helps me do is keep my life simple that is I am just going to worry about variations in the x direction and since I am talking about a stability problem I want to uh, worry about the time dependency as well, okay. So, now uh, I am just going to draw the slab here. Imagine, so this is porous, okay, all kinds of pores all over the place, some random network of pores will be there and this is a porous solid. So, the transport of gas, assuming this is a gaseous uh, reaction take, which takes place on the solid surface, transport of gas inside the solid is going to be only by diffusion, okay. There is not, no, not going to be any great velocity inside this pore. So, what I am trying to talk to you uh, say uh, here is that the only flux which is going to transport the species inside the slab is the diffusive process, okay. We are also going to keep life simple and say that um, there is no exothermicity and so we are talking about the temperature being constant, okay. So, point is uh, isothermal reaction, okay. If we have a negligible heat of reaction, and diffusion is the only mechanism for transport of mass, okay. Now, 
you can uh, write down the governing equations in many different ways, but we will just uh, do a shortcut in the sense you know how a species balance looks, okay. You have uh, the uh, convective term, you have the diffusive term, you have the accumulation term and you have the uh, generation term. So, we will just uh, simplify things here. We just say that there is no convection, it is only accumulation term. The species balance can be written as the partial derivative of u equals okay so this is in some sense this is Reynolds transport theorem for you but I'm doing a species balance here I'm doing it for a small infinitesimal control volume what does this term represent this term represents the what is this the accumulation term okay this is the flux okay because of only diffusion convection I am saying is not present in the in a, uh, when we did the navier stokes equation you had the convective flow term on the left hand side you only have the viscous transport here so this is your diffusive flux so basically if you had your uh, overall species balance which you must have done in one of your earlier courses if you write it down and you drop off terms which do not exist then you will get this equation that is the idea you I am dropping off all the velocity terms that goes off um, I uh, have diffusion only in the x direction the y and z direction I have taken it to be infinity so I do not worry about it and this here I am just saying is my reaction kinetics. So, this kind of reaction kinetics would actually arise when you have an autocatalytic reaction, okay. So, this is you are used to things like first order reaction, second order reaction. If it had been a first order reaction, you would have had just U or something like that. But since it is an autocatalytic reaction, it is U times 1 minus U. So, U is basically representing something like a concentration. Okay, so he, here U is concentration of a species. Clearly, this is going to be subject to some boundary conditions, and the boundary conditions. conditions are uh, taken as u equals 0 at x equals 0 and l. So, the thickness of the slab is l, okay. The thickness of the slab is l and at both the ends I am just saying u is 0. So, that is my governing equation. So, what I did is I just did my first step which is write out the governing equation for the system. So, I have a catalytic reaction which is isothermal taking place in the slab. I do not have any temperature. So, isothermal no energy balance. I only need to worry about how the concentration is changing, okay. And uh, I need to uh, forget about velocity because there is no uh, convection inside the porous catalyst, okay, very negligible. So, now, the next thing is we need to find a steady state, right. So, for the steady state, what do you do? Steady state means you need to put USS implies d by dt of USS is 0, which means okay subject to so since so i'm looking at the steady state the time derivative goes off and my steady state has to satisfy this equation 
So one of the reasons why we actually chose this problem, so the one steady state which immediately pops out is one which can be spatially uniform. Can you, is supposing you do not have any variation in the x direction, okay. Suppose you do not have any variation in the x direction, then this second derivative is going to be 0. So, there is a spatially uniform state or homogeneous state where the concentration everywhere inside my pellet is equal. So, what kind of a spatially homogeneous solution can this system have? Clearly, if this is 0, then USS could be 0 or it could be 1, okay. So, if we look for a spatially homogeneous solution, okay, then d square u s s by d x s square equals 0, which implies u s s times 1 minus u s s equals 0 or u s s equals 0 or 1. But then your solution should also satisfy the boundary conditions, okay. So, this guy u s s equal to 0 satisfies the boundary conditions, whereas u s s equal to 1 does not satisfy the boundary conditions. So, u s s equal to 1 is not a solution, the only thing that is possible is u s s equal to 0 is the only solution possible, you understand. So, u s s equal to 0 is the only spatially homogeneous solution, okay. So, my question now is when would this the concentration inside my catalyst be spatially uniform, okay. I mean this is a possible solution. So, now what are the different processes which are actually taking place inside your system? One is you have the diffusive process and one is you have the reaction process, okay. So, if the diffusion is very, very fast, diffusion remember works to make things spatially uniform. So, basically if the diffusion is very, very fast, your concentration is going to become uniform. Whereas, if the diffusion is slow, you are going to have a, you can see a concentration gradient, but this is just English diffusion being fast and diffusion being uh, small. What you want to do is so, in relation to the rate of reaction, I expect that there is if the diffusion is larger than a critical value, I expect that u equal to 0 is going to be u s s equal to 0 is going to be something which I can observe because if even if there was a, some disturbance, diffusion is going to make it even. Whereas, if there is a disturbance and if diffusion is very slow, there will be a non-uniform solution, okay. So, there will be a variation of concentration inside the uh, catalyst pellet. So, that is the question which we are trying to answer. We are trying to find out whether there is some kind of a, what is the critical value quantitatively, can I quantify this? Just like you were able to quantify in terms of the Reynolds number 2100, okay. Can I quantify the value of this diffusion coefficient in some kind of a dimensionless group which will tell me when is this stable, when is this unstable. So, that is the question, okay. And uh, the reason why I talked about diffusion is because see at the end of the day, whatever mathematics tells us has to be in line with whatever our physics tells us. It is not that they are two completely different things. So, as engineers, we have to put mathematics and physics together, okay. So, now, uh, the, so what I have given you is a possible solution which is spatially homogeneous, which uh, is USS is equal to 0. It satisfies the differential equation, satisfies the boundary condition, okay. And I am uh, telling you that look, uh, this is a spatially homogeneous solution. I expect the solution to be stable when diffusion is very fast as compared to reaction, okay. But uh, is there a critical threshold value which decides what is fast and what is slow and that is what mathematics will tell us.
okay and that's what we're going to find out by doing the linear stability analysis so now what we are going to do is we're going to assume okay so let me write this down so if d is large and i'm going to put this in uh, you know inverted commas because I want to compare that with something else which has the same units of meter square per second. Okay, d is large, then disturbances in the concentration get smeared out. And we can expect the spatially uniform solution to be stable. Okay, but d is large means what? D is larger. So, what is the critical threshold of d above which we have stability that's the question okay and of course one should not talk in terms of d because it the diffusion coefficient will depend upon your uh, slab and all that. It is good to work in dimensionless uh, coordinates. Okay, it's preferable to work with dimensionless groups for having. greater validity that is what I want otherwise we say diffusion that is specific to a particular system rather than in a dimensionless group then it becomes more general okay. So, let us go to the next step. So, I did the first step write out the governing equation I wrote the um, I did not derive it but I mean it is okay I think we just uh, wrote out the uh, steady state now we have to do the linearization. Right. So, I just want to mention that this corresponds to x equal to 0 here and x equals L here. Because that was my thickness of my slab. So, what we are going to do is look at imposing small disturbances. And what do these disturbances measure? They measure the deviation from the steady state. Okay, the disturbances basically tells you how far the system is away from the steady state. Your steady state is USS equals zero. So now I'm going to. This is my disturbance variable. I'm just putting the tilde on top to signify the disturbance, and this tells me how far is U from the steady state. Okay, U is the actual concentration and USS is the steady state concentration. In this case, of course, USS turns out to be 0, but you could have a problem where USS is not 0. Okay, so I mean, just to keep things general, I am writing it like this. So I have U tilde written as U minus USS. And I am what I am going to ask, tell you, ask you to remember is that this is of order epsilon, this is very small. Okay. So, if it is of order epsilon, I can, uh, I may want to specify that it is of order epsilon by writing it as uh, to explicitly uh, show this, I can write this as epsilon times u tilde equals 
u minus u s s, where now u tilde will be of order 1 because epsilon u tilde is of order epsilon. Okay. So, this is to uh, explicitly show that this is of order epsilon. I just want to put things in perspective with what you have already done in perturbation analysis. So, now it is like saying I am seeking u s, u s s plus epsilon u 1, oh sorry, u tilde. Okay. This is just to make you relate what you did in your regular perturbation series, you sort u s, u s s plus epsilon u tilde etcetera. Okay. In the absence of disturbances, it is equal to u s s. Now, epsilon tells you the magnitude of the disturbance, that epsilon told you something about the parameter value. Okay. So, we write it like, like this and now I just have to substitute this in my differential equation. Okay. I need to substitute this um, particular form in my differential equation and since I am considering only small deviations, I am going to linearize the term. The only term which is non-linear is my reaction term which has the u quadratic dependency u multiplied by 1 minus u. Okay. So, let me just go back and write this equation here. equals this is my equation x squared. Maybe I should just write it here itself. Huh? Okay, wait a second. This is u and I am going to substitute for u this expression u s s plus epsilon u tilde. Okay? Substitute for u in terms of u tilde, what do you get? d by dt of u s s plus u tilde times epsilon equals d times d square u s s plus epsilon u tilde by d x square plus a times multiplied by 1 minus okay this is multiplying that what i want to do is group all the terms together of order epsilon to the power 0 and of order epsilon order epsilon to the power 0 will be my base state my steady state solution order epsilon to the power 1 will be my linearized solution because I am going to basically take only the linear terms. Okay. Order epsilon to the power 0 gives the steady state and should give the steady state. Order epsilon to the power 1 should give the linearized equations. Okay. So, let us just do that. So, I have d at order epsilon to the power 0, d by dt of u s s equals d d square u s s by d x square plus a times u s s times 1 minus u s s. That is what I get because this multiplied by this will give me epsilon term, this multiplied by this gives me the 0th order term, okay. this is not x is it? Okay. and this is multiplied by this will give me order epsilon. So, this is my steady state solution about which I am doing the linearization okay. because steady state that goes out to 0 and, that, and the solution that we are looking at is u s s equal to 0. This satisfies the boundary conditions. What about the order epsilon to the power 1 term? I get d by d t of u tilde equals d by d square by d x square of u tilde plus. Now, I have a u s s times u tilde.
plus a u tilde times 1 minus u s s okay when I have this multiplying this I have one term and this multiplying this I have the other term the other term is of order epsilon square so I neglect it clearly now what I am going to do is use the information which I already have about u s s just like you did your perturbation series analysis you got to use this information about the steady state being 0 and I put steady state equal to 0 and then I am fine is that okay I'm, minus yeah minus what is this this is minus here sin of second term should be negative no a u tilde multiplied by 1 minus u s s it looks okay to me this one yeah yeah second term should be negative you are right this should be negative yeah you are right that is negative Yep. Now put u s s equal to 0 okay? and your linearized equation is d by d t of u tilde equals d times d square u tilde by d x square plus a u tilde. That is your equation at order epsilon to the power 1. And what are the boundary conditions? The boundary conditions are going to be u is going to satisfy 0, 0, u steady state satisfies 0, 0, so u tilde also has to satisfy 0, 0 at the boundary, okay? And u tilde equals 0 at x equals 0, comma l, okay? So this comes from the boundary condition, you have to put this perturbation thing again in the boundary condition and get this. What I want to emphasize here is that whenever you that is a linear equation for you, because that is what we have done, we essentially done a linearization. You could have done this linearization using Jacobian, which is what was discussed last time, you can you will get the same result. Okay? You should do that and verify for yourself. So the at order epsilon to the power 1, the equation is linear. And what do I get? A u tilde and u tilde equals 0 at x equals 0, comma l. The other, not only is it linear, it is also homogeneous. And I think if you do a linearization, whenever you are working on a problem, after doing the linearization and you, after looking at things and order epsilon to the power 1, if you find that your equation is not linear, then something is wrong. What you do? God is wrong. You find that there is a non-homogeneity, that means something is wrong. The point I am trying to make here is that the linearized equation should always admit 0 as a solution. Okay? So, the, this, the linearized equation, linearized equation must admit 0 as a solution always. So, that is a simple check you can make. Now, just because it admits 0 as a solution does not mean you have it right, but if it does not admit it, no, it is wrong. Okay? So, I think that is the only thing you can uh, do. So, what I am trying to tell you is that this is linear and homogeneous and now, you know, so once I'm, I started off with a non-linear problem and I got a steady state, I have done a linearization and now that it is a linear equation, I am kind of comfortable, I am in my comfort zone because I know how to solve this equation using some of the things that you people have learned in your class like separation of variables, okay? So now, I have a linear equation subject to homogeneous, my boundary conditions also have to be homogeneous, everything has to be homogeneous, only then I can have this. So this is something like an eigenvalue problem, if you remember ax equals lambda x, x equal to 0 is always a solution, there are some values of lambda for which we have a non-zero solution, so that is the kind of thing we are looking at here. So zero, 
you know, as a solution must always be satis uh, satisfy this, no matter what the parameters are. And what we are trying to find out is, um, because it is linear, since it is linear, we can solve this analytically. So, uh, for example, of course, it is a linear equation, it is a partial differential equation. So, this is one level of complexity more than what you did yesterday. Yesterday, you did not have this x squared term, you only have, have the time derivative term after, after linearization, but you have two equations. Today, I have only one equation, but it is partial differential. When we start doing fluid flow problems, it is going to be uh, partial differential and more than one variable. Okay, and by the way, this is also very relevant to multi-phase flow because I'm talking about a gas in a solid. So there's a two, there are two phases, right? There's a solid and there's a gas. So if it, don't ask me how is this relevant to fluid flow? It is definitely there's a fluid flowing and there's a solid particle. Okay, so this is very relevant to. I was beginning to justify to myself that this is indeed relevant for this course, and it is. Okay, so now uh, how do you go about solving this? Um, Yeah, who remembers his calculus course on partial differential equations? We will solve right now using separation of variables. So this u is a function of x and t and what I am going to do is I am going to write seek u is a function of x and t as x of x multiplying t of t. Okay, product of two uh, functions, one which depends only on x and the other which depends only on time. What we will do is we will, uh, what you normally do is you substitute this in that partial differential equation, get the x dependency, get the time dependency and then you will be in a position to uh, understand by looking at the growth rate, the exponential term which I spoke about earlier, whether the thing is stable or unstable, right. So that is what we will do, substitute this in the, actually this should be u tilde, huh? in the u tilde uh, equation. And what do you get? X of x multiplied by T dash equals D multiplied by X double dash of x times T plus A times X of x times T of T. Okay. What we do now is we divide throughout by x multiplied by t, okay. Divide by x t, and what do you get? T dash by t equals d times x double prime plus a x divided by x, okay, they just uh, divided by x t and that is what I get. And so the uh, classical argument that this left hand side is a function only of time, the right hand side is a function only of x, so the only way these guys can be equal is this, this is equal to a constant and what this basically tells me is I can solve for this ordinary differential equation which is first order in time, I can solve for this ordinary differential equation which is second order in space and then uh, hope to proceed to get, getting my solution. So, we will do this uh, tomorrow and we will wrap up this problem, okay.